What's up, everyone? Welcome to Unmasked, where things are discovered, uncovered, brought to the light, and made known. I'm your host, Lamar Barrett, coming live to you from PG County, Maryland. If you're interested in finding out about the untold stories behind being a college basketball coach, this is the show for you. Being a former assistant men's college basketball coach for 16 years, there are so many untold stories behind the scenes in the life of a college coach. Now, let's unmask them. Today's guest is a young and bright assistant coach with a tremendous work ethic, a great talent evaluator, terrific teacher, and great skill development coach, a future head coach in the profession, and she's a Pittsburgh native, Marita Gilpreece. Now, you'll, you'll never hear me. I'm not going to call her by her first name. She goes by Rita. So when we go through the rest of the show, when you hear Rita, I'll, I'll say that so I won't mention her by her first name. And I'll say a little bit about her uh, bio before we bring her on. Um, she was an outstanding, she was an uh, outstanding player at Ryder, uh, where she currently works, but she spent four years at Ryder, where she was a captain for her last two years, uh, finished up her career, uh, actually had a chance to go over to Ireland and play professionally for a year, where she actually averaged a double-double. And we're going to find out why she just decided not to keep playing once she was done. Um, uh, but, you know, she spent a year over in Ireland, received her master's degree at the same time uh, as she played professionally. And then from there, she gets a chance to go back to her alma mater. Uh, and she works uh, where she's been working for the last five years. Her first year back, she was a director of basketball ops. And then for the last four years, she was promoted in 2017. Uh, she's an assistant coach where they've done a terrific job the last few years you know, uh, in uh, 1920. Uh, they had, you know, the best record in the league, won their first round game. So she finished the regular season. I think they were 18 and two in the league, finished, their, you know, played their first quarterfinal game win, and then we shut down with the pandemic. So who knows what would have happened uh, last season. But I want to welcome to the show, actually, a young lady that I've gotten a chance to know and I listen to in, in a uh, group that we're currently, uh, the organization we're calling in 12 inches over. Uh, it's almost like a fraternity, sorority t uh, type of organization, and it's been going on for you know almost ten months now. And I want to welcome to the show. How you doing, Rita? Hi, Lamar. Thank you so much for having me. It's really a pleasure. Look, well, we're gonna get right to it. I mean, we're here for um, uh, to get unmasked and find out a lot about you mm -hmm. um, and, and and things in your career. So one of the first questions that you had, you were fortunate, you were fortunate to come back and work for uh, the coach that you played for, mm -hmm. um, which always doesn't happen. So you're always, how you left as a player and how you were treated as a player, you thought she was tough on you as a player. Mm -hmm. You know, people don't realize how much they're even tougher on you as an assistant coach. They think it's like an easy transition. But <laughs> <laughs> There's no handbook to being a college coach. Right. Um, tell me about your first day, first week, first month, um, after things are done with human resources and orientation, especially when no one gives you direction because you're just thrown into the fire. It's no like, yeah. okay, this is how we do things. Tell me about that. Right. So it's, it's kind of interesting. So as you mentioned, I came into the business as a director of operations for Rowdy University. And up until that point, our women's basketball team did not have a director of operations. So I didn't get officially started with the team until I wasn't under contract until November 1st. So I was kind of like around and, you know, trying to get my hands wet as far as much as I could. Um, but it, I wasn't, you know, as able to be involved as you might like to be in like all the preseason stuff because obviously I wasn't technically employed. And then you want to add to like the special caveat and, you know, of the year I ended up tearing my, uh, my Achilles tendon like October 22nd in like an inner squad scrimmage. Um, so I was, and I got surgery November 1st that year. So it was, it was a fantastic time <laughs> to get into the business. So yeah, it was, it was a good time. Wow. Okay. And you know what? I forgot to even mention this too. You are an author as well. So that may come up along the conversation, <laughs> all the things you have done, but you definitely uh, have written a book. So, you know, that may come up in, in, in doing this interview. Now, it, now you're in the business, you're assistant coach, mm -hmm. and we talk about recruiting. Recruiting is the lifeline of college athletics. Uh, you were a good student. You were a good player. So now you have to find the one thing I always say the secret ingredient is 
for success is you have to find good players. Mm -hmm. You have to find good people. Mm -hmm. And then you need to find good students. And it's not always it have to be an A student or a B student. It's a student who cares about academics, who mm -hmm. wants to get a degree. Mm -hmm. um, those are the people you have to find. Um, so what was your best and worst recruiting story you've had in a short time since you've been at Ryder? Um, hmm, let me see. Well, we know we'll start with the best. Um, so last year, just because it's, it's recent, last summer, we were fortunate enough to have six seniors graduate, you know, obviously they end their career on, on the high note with the pandemic breaking out, but obviously very well decorated the defensive player of the year, you know, two time Mac player of the year, WNBA draft picks, like, uh, I'm sorry, two second teamers. So we had a, a very well accomplished senior group. Um, but then we knew that, that they were going to be going on to, you know, their future endeavors. So this summer I was like, you know, I kind of, li I'm the liaison with junior college coaches. And, you know, whenever we decide to kind of go that route in recruiting, that's my, my wheelhouse, so to speak. So we were able to secure pretty much two, two young ladies that come to join our program, sight unseen, obviously could not travel, could not come visit. So just based on the relationship we were able to build over the phone and, um, you know, via our coach, their coaches and, um, our, you know, just believing in who we are and just our kind of track record and get two two young ladies to come. Cause obviously our our four incoming rookies, they had they had been on campus. So yes, it wasn't their the expected freshman year, but they knew who what they were getting. These two, Anna and Lanasia, Nay as she's called, did not. So I'm very proud that they were able to kind of come in and blend and, and you know understand what Rider Heart and Soul was about and then also represent what it was about because you know that not not a guarantee so I'm very proud of that and up until this point I don't have to say that if I have like any cool if we have like any like misses there's just like you know some ladies who you think are coming to you all up until that last moment and then they you know decide to take their talents to South Beach or something you know on, on their LeBron so what can you say? That's part of the game. So you can't be too mad about it. Right. That is part of the game. That's what people and, – and, and the thing about it is you can't take it personal, even though right. you want to because you never know if a kid may end up coming back to you in the long run. You this know, year. so it happens. Yeah. And That's it's right. interesting you say that because um, I want to say at least two or three of our, our alums now – had ended up war recruiting. Now, granted, I wasn't part of that recruiting process because I was pretty much their team, ended up being their teammate. But a couple of our, our young ladies who, ended, who are alums now were first recruited, chose to go elsewhere, and then ended up, you know, believing that uh, Ryder was the place for them. Um, going back as far as my some of my teammates from 14, 15, um, Lachey Banks, and then Robin Perkins, who obviously ended up going on to be a very well decorated, our first player of the year. Um, who else is in there? Mari, Amari Johnson, again, Defensive Player of the Year. She was recruited heavily as well, ended up coming back to us from Ryder. I'm sorry, from Rhode Island. And Leia Farr, again, recruited before she went to Nevada and then ended up coming back to us. So we have a good feel for who we think could, could match us. It's just a matter of when they decide to come, you know, get into the fold. So we love them and wish everyone good luck all the same. And that, and that happens. That, that's good stuff. Like, now, we all know this. This business... <laughs> is uh the profession and i'll say it um there's a lot of time there's a lot of time involved in this and people always ask like so what do you do during the off season um i still coach you know like or what do you do besides you know coaching like they think you actually like a teacher in the classroom all day and then coach so i, I and i like asking this question because i, I don't think people understand this um what did you have to sacrifice? Now you were a division one athlete and you know how much time you put in, right. but now what did you have to sacrifice achieving your current level of success as a coach? Um, I mean, I think it goes without saying just in the business, you, particularly, you know, depending on like how, how near or far you are from your, your hometown or your, you know, your family, you don't necessarily see them as often. Like it's pretty much Christmas and in postseason, whenever that might, you know, get around to you. 
Um, and then depending on what the, the calendar is looking like, what can you do in like that August and the summer squeezes in there. So it's family time. So if that encompasses, you know, weddings, funerals, then uh, family reunions, depending on, on the time of year, then that just is what it is. Like, that's just, oh, like we're having a cookout real quick. There, there's no cookouts for you. <laughs> Unless you put that cookout exactly when I can make it, then I'm gonna just have to catch you or you're just gonna have to send me the pictures because I, I can't go. So it is what it is. You get used to it or you got to get used to it relatively quickly because the, calen the calendar is a calendar more often than not. The calendar is pretty much consistent. It's, it's life that changes around it, so. Yeah, that's so true. And, and I, I like what you said. And you're around the age where whether it's your friends or teammates who are not coaching, mm -hmm. it's time for them to start getting married. And, you mm -hmm. know, they want to go on the trips to locations and, mm -hmm. you know, like left, like the pandemic now. But like, hey, right. we're going down to, uh, you know, we're, we're going down to Cancun. You want to go and like, um, no, we got workouts or, you know, it's, that's what they don't understand. Like, no, I, I can't do this. Like, no. If you're not doing it when I need to, then I can't do it. I'm saying like, I can't tell you the amount of grief I caught from like different members of the family. Like, you don't, you telling me you're not free on April 3rd? That's a Wednesday. What makes you think I'm free on a Wednesday? Do you ask other gainfully employed people to be free on miscellaneous Wednesdays? Like, like my, do my job doesn't cease just because of like the specific basketball season's over. There's other parts and pieces, um, which I think is important because how much do people actually know about the the cycle of college basketball unless you you've gone through it yourself and clearly it's not much correct you're right you're right um scouting reports we all know how important they they are um it is it's interesting how much time and i don't think people understand this even the young people that want to get into the business like how much time you actually invest in these scouting reports and you can almost tell when it's who scouted is when they're on the sideline because they're now they're more vocal you know <laughs> they're standing up they're, they're, they're you know because you're a competitor you want to compete um and you expect them to be the same way you like an amount of time you spend in a scouting report mm -hmm. you think like they should be locked in just as well so but we also got to remember they're students they got other things going in their life so you have to give them just enough if you give them too much they go they're gonna forget it so talk about, and, and then now the coach comes involved. So you're like, coach, she's really not, she's a, she's just an okay shooter. She's two for her last 30 from three. Then she goes to make her first two shots. Coach turned to you and you said she couldn't shoot. I didn't say that. I said she was a capable shooter. She's just struggling. Like what was your best and worst? I mean, you know, it's a scout report that you've had over the, over the last few years. Um, well, to, to be honest, I think beside this year, we've had the, I've had the best like quote unquote scouting record of like any of the assistants over the past couple of years, which I, I pat myself on the back one only slightly. I mean, obviously it's the team game, but, um, to your point, there is a lot of time spent on it. And I'm absolutely one of those coaches that are like, like I get real and super animated. One of my teammates and friends like niche was telling me like yo you be on the floor like I'd be like on all fours because you know you can't get too close to that sideline but especially this year if I was not in that front row I was active in that second row so like you do get that investment because you know you watch hours and hours and hours now and my head coach watches tons of film too but of course you're also supposed to be that that second and or first depending on what situation you're talking about expert on the bench about who these people are and that's got to come out because there ain't no sense in saving the knowledge like, if you got to know it, your head coach got to know it. Now, whatever you might share with the team is debatable, and y'all can agree upon that. But when it's go time, you better have as many freaking answers you could possibly have. So, yeah, good times. You're, you're so right. And and, that, I, and that's why I said that when you said, uh, yeah, I've had the most scouts. Coaches, that's what they don't realize. Coaches do keep count. And mm -hmm. they make it a competitive thing sometimes against each other, like, yeah, you know, I was I was six and zero this year, right? Or you know, like they're gonna throw that number out there. So it's always, um, and the players know it too. As much as you think, like they keep count themselves. So trust me, <laughs> it's a whole thing, especially, and you know, depending on what type of consistencies on your staff, we tend to have we've had like you know the same staff for now. This is the end of year three, but by and large, that there's not a whole lot of influx in our staff. So 
we also have the same assignments as far as um conference scouts go so it's super intense like I'm trying to get these these six wins I'm trying to get and get them not that I don't care about the other like whatever that 10 games that is but I want these six bad bad because I know I'm like the back of my hand like all right this she's gonna be here 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 she do this this and that and we need to lock her 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 up and then we're gonna be good so. <laughs> that's great stuff um what's the biggest challenge you've experienced since you've been a college coach? Um, I think, and I will argue this is probably in any industry, is making sure you are taking care of yourself as a, as a person, because I'm a huge advocate for just, you know, mental health and just personal accountability and, and, and self-awareness. So if I'm not bringing my absolute best self to the campus every day, to work every day, to Zoom every day, I'm not giving my young ladies the best and that's what I signed up to do. And I think that's important. I think they deserve that. And I want to model what it is I'm asking them to do because ultimately they got to be able to, you know, have these same skill sets whenever they do. And obviously same thing for young men. They, whenever they go on to their next stage of their lives, they can't be so focused on, you know, one particular thing that them as a person starts to sacrifice their health starts to go their, you know, or having a, a breakdown and, and things are going are not going well. So I'm super, 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 super intentional about making sure I'm all right. So I can give, 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 give. If I'm empty, I can't give. That's powerful right now. I, I, I love that. Now, do you ever find do you ever find that there are things about you that people misunderstand? What are because like some people be like, yeah, I'm really passionate and people take that like. But is there anything that people might misunderstand about you? I don't think so. I think, uh, you know, I'm pretty, pretty candid. I'm pretty straightforward. I, I try to be this, you know, it was very important for me when I got into the business to, to not be, have like a coaching face and then like this other, be this other person after hours. Like I'm 100% Marty Gilcrease at work and I'm 100% Marty Gilcrease when I leave the office. So I try to, you know, speak from that same place. And I think that's what makes me a good coach is I'm not trying to be nobody else. I'm, I'm going to be this person. I'm going to coach you from this perspective as a 20 some odd year old young black woman um, who's been through the coach and like, you know, who's been through the program. So I, I know what I'm talking about when I'm trying to inform our young ladies on what it takes to, to make things happen. Um, and I don't think I could try to do that from any other place because that wouldn't be, that wouldn't be accurate. And I wouldn't be doing our ladies, you know, any favors by, by sugarcoating or trying to be somebody different. Awesome. And, I, and I've heard some things and, and like it kind of piggybacks right to my next question. Like we're all educators in this business and that's what people don't understand. We're still teaching. Uh, but like, what do you try to teach or educate your players besides basketball? Mm -hmm. I think what I've noticed just over these past couple of, of seasons, um, just both on the team and just at large is the self-talk of our young ladies is not always positive. I mean, granted, you know, some, there's some that are uncharacteristically confident and I salute that, but by and large, there's like, we're somewhere along the line, there's like this doubt that's just like inherent. Like, I don't know, maybe, or it's not supposed to be my moment. And it's, speaking life to that those parts of them where it's like no you got you didn't get this far because you're like you know Jane Schmo the bum like you have a skill set you you have some things you have some tools you are a person who is capable of of anything you put your mind to uh and, and kind of give them that that power because if you're coming from the power perspective then you can build it but if you're looking for an, an internal conf the confidence that's supposed to come from within you can't build on that foundation. So I think that's the, probably the biggest one and just like overall uh, mental game. That's good. That's good stuff, man. Mm, I'm, I'm, I'm learning. I'm, I'm, I'm sitting here and it's nuggets and uh, you're dropping nuggets. I got to write some of this stuff down. Um, what, what are your best and worst memories in coaching? And a lot of times people get caught up like, oh, my best and worst memories, you know, whether they won a championship, lost a championship. You know, they, you you know, I think a lot of times people forget, like, you're still in the business of tr turning these kids into actually young men, young women, into men and women by the time they leave, mm -hmm. or the days of them just graduate, seeing someone graduate. But what are your best and worst memories in coaching in, in, in such a young, young career so far? I mean, 
I'm always have like I'm always teary on like a senior day because you know that's the the culmination or not culmination but it's a very memorable moment so you know obviously the pandemic I'm glad those particular seniors still got that moment and it's it's very it's I don't know it's just kind of emotional like you get the the families calling in you get the videos and it's just like wow it went quickly and it was in the blink of an eye is over but it was beautiful to kind of be in that moment so senior days hands down one of my favorites teammates are crying I'm crying it's ugly there's snot but it's beautiful in the same way and then as far as a, a challenging moment I won't call it you know a bad memory but there's definitely been some people that experienced some loss so it was powerful but at the same time it was like just realizing how impactful you know college and these college age years can be uh, so one of our young ladies she lost her father like in February we you know we were playing Quinnipiac that week and then the funeral ended up being like basically right before we had to head down I'm sorry head up to Albany at, at that year um so we, we swung by the the fiend the funeral and it's moments like that where it's like wow this is bigger than basketball and I'll, I'll never forget that particular moment in my life just to be able to be there for her um and then, you know, all the, the emotions and the grief that, that go along with it. Um, but that was very, that's very real, you know, like it's very, 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 very real stuff that happened in these young lady lives. And I think the moments like that kind of remind us. So, so true. I, 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 I feel you hundred percent. Cause you don't, you don't expect it. You don't, you know, it happens and then you like, you have to, and these kids now they have to learn how to deal with adversity and, Sometimes you have to teach them the things of that nature. So I, I truly feel you on that. I'm going to ask you this. This is more of an entertaining, could be could be good or bad. You don't have to drop the name. But what what is the strangest thing a player has done outside of the basketball court that you just look back and was like, I, I can't believe she did that? Or like, you just like, wow. Um, anything that just jumps out to you that you's like, that was strange or that was weird. I don't know, you know, with like just I'm just thinking right now, like our our TikTok dances. So it's like, you know, there's a whole that alone is a whole different ball game. Cause obviously you get people dance that don't normally dance. So that's cool. Um I don't I don't know if y'all like if you're in, involved, but like eyelashes are definitely a thing. So it's like boom, one day you good, next day everybody got lashed. I'm like, oh y'all fabulous now. Um, what else? Hmm. And let me think here. And then some of us like to just kind of we're in the office late night. We had like one like evening where we just really broke out into like a Whitney Houston sing along. So I'm not gonna say we talented singers. Some of some of us can hold a tune, but we are performers. I will give <laughs> I will give them that. They will give you a show. So there we're 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 a bunch. We are some characters. That's, that's, awesome. that's awesome. That's awesome. I'm going to ask you this because it's a lot of times I know you, the one thing I know, like I'm just listening to you mm -hmm. sometime even on the show and we had something scheduled before, but you're like, yo, I really want to watch this game. So obviously you're a student of the game, but if you had a chance to sit down and I'm going to say three or four coaches and it could be past or present, if you had a chance to sit down with four coaches, um, and just have lunch and dinner with them, pick their brain, what makes them tick, what made them successful for what they did. Like, who are four coaches that you would sit down with? It could be anyone. And, and, and just pick their brain and, and, and have some time, have a chance to spend some time with them. Oh, that's a great question. Um... I'm just thinking, like, recent, like, just from a couple different perspectives. So... I would love to sit down with Coach Staley. I mean, I, I, you know, I haven't had that opportunity up until this point. Um, I would love to, like, you know, hear personally from Coach Adia and what she's been able to do in, in such a short term. Um, Coach Stringer and her longevity. Um, and then I would, I, you know, I'd be remiss just not mentioning Coach Summit as well. Just, I just think, the 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 first three obviously being very very impactful strong black women in an in industry that is only now starting to kind of open their arms to to their leadership 
So I would love to hear what that what that's been like and you know what it continues to be like, obviously. Um, and then just the kind of the background personal stories of, of Coach Summon and her rise to take in Tennessee from where it started to, to where it obviously ended in her tenure. Those are four powerful people. I, I mean, I, hey, I, I would like to sit down with Don Taylor, trust me, <laughs> and, uh, as well. Um, another entertaining one. So this is thought, I don't know how much you are into it, but what movie or TV show title best describes your week? My week? Let me think here. <laughs> <laughs> that's not the question I thought she was going to ask. I thought, like, oh, give me a show I watched. I'm like, all right, I got that. But, like, what describes my week? Um, it's funny. I'm going to just go with this because I also think it's kind of important. Um, so we were doing a, a show on, on Facebook early in the season before things got hectic, and it was called Out of Bounds. And I do think that's kind of the life of any coach. It's what happens when you're on the on the court but life is obviously so much more than that so it's out of bounds would be everything that happens that either gets you to <laughs> to the court or what happens after um and you know the, what it takes to kind of cross the line between the two so I would call it out of bounds awesome um what's your favorite word or phrase that you like to use <laughs> um uh, mine I would say probably Intent, my word of the year, because we always have a, a one word of the year, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that, is allow. However, one of the things I say more most often is probably like intentionality. Um, yeah, probably intentionality. Make sure we're doing everything with a purpose. Um, or from like quote my father, it's like had and had that. Don't ask me why. <laughs> or in the meantime, in between time. Those are probably two of my, my, my sayings from my dad I, I quote often. Awesome. Uh, what's the best piece of advice you've ever been given? I would say after my time at A Step Up, I've been to two, looking forward to another one coming up very soon. Uh, Coach Yo, and then she also did a, another talk at the WBCA in Tampa, but talking about being able to bloom where you're planted. So, you know, just the whole mindfulness aspect of what's the best you can get out of this situation? What is the, what is the, the best aspirations? What are the best tools? What are the best lessons that you can learn right now, right here? You don't need no extra. Um, you, you thinking about tomorrow doesn't help you. Thinking about yesterday doesn't help you. If you're here and you're committed to being the best you can right here, right now, then you can't help but, you know, but to skyrocket and be great. If you're thinking about other things and you know things that aren't in your control, you, you're just you're setting yourself. You're doing a disservice to yourself. So I would say bloom where you're planted. It's huge. That, that's doubt. See, I'm, I'm writing that down. That's 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 <laughs> enough. That's like that. no, hashtag no ceilings. That's not. <laughs> that's where I got it. Thank you very much. Um, I'm gonna ask you this question: What does success mean to you? Because a lot of people think it's always wins and losses, but like. What does success mean to you? As like as a as my role within my role as an assistant coach, or just, or just even life in general, like it could be either. Or. Right. So, I would say success for me is being able to encourage young women to live empowered, inspired lives, so that when they look upon their collegiate careers, their collegiate experiences, it's, you know, it was transformational. It was foundational. It was preparational for where they went on to do with their lives. Wow. Awesome. Um, that, I'm just, another powerful statement. Um, where's your happy place? Where's my happy place? Um, I am... I'm obviously a basketball player, but I was probably a first a, a band geek and a bookworm. So it is absolutely like probably Barnes and Noble, just trying to walk around <laughs> and plucking things and seeing, you know, I, I pride myself on trying to keep myself well, well read and, and learn some things. Because again, the minute I stop learning, the minute I stop being as great as use as possible to the young ladies. So I'm trying to always keep things coming in and keep um, new ideas flowing up in here. 
and that takes my preferred method is reading you could do audio books and whatnot but i prefer to really get the book out and get the highlighter rocking and take some notes wow uh, you know what and i find more people do like the reading i like if i ask my wife that she'll say the same thing like last night just like she's like ah. Uh, I just finished my 48th book for the year. And I'm like, in three months? Like, she has a goal of, like, 100 and plus books. She's an English teacher, so it's a little different. So she, like, reads. Like, I'm like, you know you're on pace for, you know, uh, a, a, huge, a huge amount. Like, you're on pace for 192 books. And she was like, yeah, but I, I don't know if I get to that. I'm like, so a lot of people, like you said, reading, happy place a lot of times. Um I don't, I know, I'm just listening to you the last few months. You're not a self-promoter. Um, you know, uh, I'm going to ask you if you had to choose three adjectives to describe yourself, mm-hmm. what would you choose? Three adjectives to describe myself. I would say genuine, driven, um, and... Let's see. Inspirational. I don't know if you could really anoint yourself that, but <laughs> that's what I, that's what I strive to be. Uh, someone else will have to tell me if I hit the mark on that. Impactful, impactful, a- impactful. I feel like I've made an impact. I love that. And I'm going to pick it back this before I even ask that. I'm going to say, what qualities do mm-hmm. you value in the people with whom you spend time? What quality do I value? Same thing. I think um, you got to be, there's like an open-mindedness there. I think it's kind of necessary when we're dealing with young women um, from all different walks of life. They're obviously going to come with a certain perspective and you can't, you can't assist them in any type of growth until you're able to kind of at least see their perspective in some ways. So I think that comes with the open mindedness. I think a, and I think determination is also important, you know, particularly there's going to be a crap ton of adversity thrown, whether you subject yourself to it or it, it finds its way onto your path, it'll come. So it's how do you react in those moments, I think is huge. And, you know, the people I like to surround myself with them uh, with those, in those moments are people who they just ain't, they don't got no quit in them. Like we, we're going to be bulldogs about it and we're going to get it done. So I, I, I respect that. And then humor. I, I have a, a dark sense of humor, which I'm going to go ahead and accept and admit. So being able to just kind of laugh at, at life as it kind of happens to you, because I think that's, I think it's critical. I think it's huge. I mean, it, it was you get dropping some great points. That I, I mean, I'm I'm listening to. It. I, I mean, I'm sitting here and I got to ask this question. This is the first time I've ever asked this question. Um, on it, you just so like you like, everything flows with you and it's so good. And so like I'm like, well, I got to try to get as much time on this as I can with her. Um, and I've never asked this question. I have been it's been written down since last June. Like, and it's kind of comical a little bit but like at what job would you be terrible because i don't think like i don't think it is one but like at what job are you like i just wouldn't be good at that job oh man well listen here this year i feel like i might have found one and i ain't gonna lie to you so this with covid and whatnot we unfortunately weren't able to have like a director of operations but then also we elected to not have managers just to kind of keep our numbers down and eliminate um you know more opportunities for covid to kind of impact our bubble so with that said i don't know if like being like an administrative assistant is like in my future because it's a lot of moving pieces and i try to stay chipper and and upbeat but when there's like a lot of move though, the amount of moving pieces that moved this year while still trying to maintain the schedule and still get everybody fed, child, I ain't, it took a lot to keep this smile smiling, let me tell you. So yeah, I don't think administrative assistant is going to be for me. Wow, found one. Wow, that's, that's pretty interesting. Um, I say what person and or event has had the most influence on your life? Well, 
Um, I think the the short answer really is coming from a situation where my mom drank when I was younger. So that kind of inspired me or put me in a position to where I wanted to get out the house more often than not, which is where I found the game of basketball um, in a very real way. And then it just so happened that I, I loved it and it happened to love me back over time. Um, so we've been in this, you know, this relation, this synergistic relationship for the last, uh, how old am I? Like it's been 15 years or so from that particular moment. Um, but, but I think all those, all that has inspired, you know, inspired me to, to learn more about health, both physical and mental. It's learned about like dealing with trauma, um, you know, personal and accountability, like all that's played a piece. And I don't think I would have done any of the things from joining the marching band in high school up into, you know, feeling like I wanted to get into coaching. I don't think any of that happens if I never pick up the basketball. So. Oh, uh, okay. Good stuff. I mean, and that's what happened. Like you, there's different things in your life that happens and, you know, you turn it into a positive. It definitely sounds like you did. You found a love. Mm -hmm. uh, so that, that, that's awesome. Um, how has coaching, affected your life well on a couple of different you know dockets I think that you, I mean, of course you get to be a an alum that's connected but I think having earned the whistle and you know and also having the jersey in in my background now is it's a connection that most like you know so not everyone gets a chance to kind of to kind of realize so I, I, I take that I don't take that for granted at all I think that's beautiful um so I'm, I would say I'm a more connected alum in that aspect I would also say that um I've got more opportunities to to speak like public speaking because you know who doesn't hate public speaking or maybe it was just me but um getting comfortable talking in crowds but then also um just the opportunity to connect with, you know, different pockets of young women and understand all the facets of team building um, has been fascinating to watch and kind of understand from like the psychology point of view and like, how does that impact, you know, who they go on to be? I don't, it remains to be seen, but it's been fascinating to kind of witness the, the starting blocks of, of their trajectory. Mm, okay. So I, I like to end on this question you're still young enough. And like I said, I see you like mm -hmm. taking coaching, to, being a head coach one day, I'm, I'm listening to a lot of the stuff you're saying, like knowing what you know now, like what would you tell your younger self, not like young, but your younger self, just a few years uh, to prepare for as an assistant coach. Cause like you came in as a director of, as a director of basketball ops and right, right away within a year, you're coaching as an assistant, but what, what would you tell your younger self? Man, because it's, it's so interesting because I know obviously I have some teammates and some friends who knew they were trying to get into the business. That, necess that wasn't necessarily my, my train of thought. So um, I don't know. I feel like maybe I'd have watched more film. I'd have you know, been more intentional about connecting with other players in the sense of just having a, a larger network maybe to kind of swap drills, ideas and whatnot um, just so I could have a bigger tool bag coming in than I did. But at the same time, you know, I can't, I'm not begrudging the the path. It's because I think you, you know, you go the way you're supposed to go. It happens how it's supposed to happen. So I think not having the tool bag, it was kind of, you know, maybe lean on personal development and making sure I'm being very intentional about the reading, about the connecting, about talking to people, about watching things. I have no shame about asking questions. I'm like, mm, could you tell me a little bit more about X, Y, and Z? Because no. So just having that, I guess, humility to say, I mean, you have to tell me a little more. Can you explain this to me? Has been huge because I won't claim to know the entire game like the back of my hand. So someone out there knows something I don't and I've been able to kind of find that along the way. Um, well, look, I want to thank you again, um, Rita, for being a guest on the show and being unmasked. Uh, is there anything that you want to leave with the viewers before we go? Oh, what do I want to leave with the viewers? I would say, particularly as a an author now, as a basketball coach, um, just to make sure that we're bringing our whole selves to to the job, and 
telling our stories is super important, particularly for coaches of color or, you know, coaches of all different types of background, because inevitably there's going to be a, a young lady who identifies with that story, but if you don't tell it, then they can't know it. And, you know, that could be isolating, could be a bit alienating when there's so much also going on on, on campuses. So I would really encourage more, more, more coaches to tell their stories and, and make sure they're speaking and being honest about those places because that's the way we can kind of elevate this game and elevate our young ladies to continue to stay in the game and making sure it's a place that they feel comfortable being their whole selves their entire time that they're in the business in whatever capacity. Wow. Well, thank you again for that. And thank you viewers for watching another great show. Stay tuned for the next guest as we get them unmasked. See you next time and stay safe.